Okay, so we are uh, going to get started in one minute. One minute countdown, and then we'll, we'll get started. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any more questions, feel free to Facebook or, or email me. Um, or if you have any good jokes, I'm open to jokes. Uh, it's always difficult to talk to an audience that you can't actually see or hear their reaction, so I'm going to assume that you are fully engaged, attentive, and laughing at everything. So, yeah, feel free to reach out and communicate in any way that there is somebody out there in the yonder uh, paying, paying attention, which I guess really is a deep metaphor for this whole act of uh, raising mental health awareness anyway. Uh, is anybody truly listening? Uh, you speak and speak and speak and, and hope so, and it goes out into the ether. Okay, we are, uh, we're gonna get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Refuat HaNefesh webinar with, um, as they stated, the one and only incredible Mark Fine. That's me. Uh, always awkward to do your own introduction. So we're gonna take the next uh, 45 minutes or so, opportunity for uh, a little bit about my own, my own story and background, uh, but really here to address uh, questions. Uh, questions that many of you emailed or or Facebook me about what it's like to live with uh, with mental illness. And if you have any questions that come for you along the way, again, feel free to email me, marc.fein at gmail.com, or Facebook me, uh, Mark Fine, M-A-R-C-F-E-I-N, and happy to address them. And really, and first and foremost, uh, thank you to everyone who's, uh, first of all, to Rafua Tanefesh for creating this platform to to spread awareness. Uh, about mental health and to create an online resource where people can ask questions and and explore. And really to everyone who's who's signing up, uh, especially if you're on the East Coast where it's early in the morning, uh, to this webinar, uh, to really take the time to to learn more, uh, to express your curiosity and, and care. Uh, because whether it's for you or for a friend or a family member, I, I hope that uh, the information that we share and the stories that I share uh, supports you in whatever stage you are. In, in your own life. Okay, so the, the first question uh, that I typically get, and some of these are questions that other people ask me, some of them are questions that I'm just asking myself, and this is uh, one of the latter, and the question is, who are you, uh, why should I care about what you're saying, and why do you talk so much about mental health awareness? Wow, thank you so much, Mark, that's a fantastic question. I'm so happy you asked that. So my name is uh, Mark Fine. I'm 31 years old, I'm an experiential Jewish educator, and I run a leadership and facilitation workshops. Uh, I am not a trained uh, mental health professional, so why are you sharing? Uh, I'm sharing because in my 20s, um, I had two major depressive episodes. I am someone with what you would hear in the mental health world, it's called speaking from lived experience. Um, sharing my own uh, perspectives based upon the experiences that, that I had. And something that I make sure to emphasize at the beginning of any of these conversations is that I am not speaking as a mental health professional. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of, as a representative of Refuat and Nefesh. I am speaking and sharing my own lived experience with, with depression. And I further emphasize on top of that that uh, this is only my own lived experience with depression. Uh, just because it was something that I experienced doesn't mean that's something that everybody else uh, experience. I don't speak on behalf of all uh, depressed people or everybody that has a mental illness. Uh, I like to joke that, in fact, there was once a conference uh, where everyone who was depressed decided, okay, who's going to be the official representative for everybody who has depression? Uh, unfortunately, people were too apathetic to show up, so the vote didn't actually happen. Um, I'm assuming you're either laughing, groaning, or awkwardly shifting in your seats. Um, all of those appropriate reactions. I, I like to start that way with a joke because if you can't joke about mental illness or if you can't really joke about anything, then it's still just as stigmatized. And one of the goals for me of webinars like this uh, is to normalize the conversation around it. And for me, that means making jokes and, and laughing about it. So why do I uh, share my experience with, with mental health? Um, I share my experience with mental health, my experience with depression, because there is so much misinformation out there and so much uh, stigma and so much mystery around what does it mean to live with a mental illness. And I specifically say live with a mental illness rather than suffer from a mental illness because the only conversations um, you'll really see uh, in the media 
and I specifically have a uh, Netflix TV series in mind at the moment, um, are depictions of suffering, the depictions of pain. And those are true, and we can talk about those, and we, we live with it. Um, one of the big shifts for me in my own life was shifting from someone who, oh, I am depressed to I am someone who lives with. And that's just a part of my identity. It's not the part that most defines who I am. It's a, it's a piece of it. And uh, we don't really see those stories uh, as much. And we don't really have those mental, mental models. And I want to present a different perspective on what it means to live with a mental illness. That's something that can be lived with. It's something that you can be successful with, uh, even, if it's a, even if it's a struggle. And I find that every time I share, um, there is somebody who gets an insight into, oh, it's okay to ask for support, or uh, this is how I can support a friend or family member. And that's, uh, that's really why, why I do it. Okay, uh, question number one. Uh, when did you know that you were depressed? <laughs> um, that's always a, a fun one to play the, the self-diagnosis game. So I first uh, realized that I might not have the healthiest mental habits, um, which is how I'll put it, um, in, in high school, uh, where I would um, have some major accomplishment, whether it be like winning a best delegate at Model UN, a security council, or whether it be uh, captaining uh, my, my soccer team or getting a great score on a test. And my first reaction would be uh, relief uh, rather than happiness. Um, I was very, very stressed, um, very success oriented, and I very much tied in my uh, sense of self-worth with my achievement. And those two were totally interlocked. And I don't think that I was depressed in high school, at least clinically, but I think that's where some of the, the mental habits um, unhealthy mental habits started and then built from built from there. The the first time I was officially diagnosed was was in my mid was in my mid twenties, and I think uh, that's actually a helpful distinction between when people say they're feeling depressed versus when they're clinically depressed, uh, because we use these words to mean very different things. So, for instance, uh, feeling tired um, is a totally normal uh, fact of life. Uh, feeling sad is a totally normal. Uh, fact of life, uh, feeling withdrawn or needing to regain your energy. Again, totally normal fact of life. The, the question becomes, at, at what point does that interfere uh, with your actual life? Um, at what point are these feelings so overwhelming that they're actually harmful and deleterious to what's going on in your life? So for instance, uh, for me, uh, it would be, wow, I'm so withdrawn that I'm not going to pick up the phone to talk to anybody because if anybody calls me, I'm assuming that I did something wrong. Or um, what does it mean for me to be tired? It means that when I try to go to sleep at night, um, it takes me hours to fall asleep because my mind's ruminating and my thoughts are bouncing all around so I don't sleep at night. Then I wake up the next morning and I don't have the energy to get out of bed. So I just continue sleeping, but it's not a refreshing sleep, it's say I'm too exhausted to do anything sleep, and then I forget to eat, and well, then I don't shower, and then I don't take care of myself, so I blow off a social engagement later that, that night, um, and totally shut down on my, my friends and family. Um, it would be getting out of the shower, and all of a sudden going, wow, I'm so tired, I'm just gonna take a little, take a little nap for a bit, um, just as a way of avoiding uh, life, and avoiding what was was going on. Um, so when it started to interfere in my career um, or interfere with my uh, dating life or social life or being with friends or family, um, that's when, uh, for me at least, I recognized, oh, I probably shouldn't be sitting on the couch all day watching uh, the OC and One Tree Hill uh, reruns on the Soap Opera Network, which, by the way, if that's your thing, totally go for it and good for you if that's what you're doing intentionally. Uh, for me personally, um, that was not what I uh, should have been spending my time on. I was definitely using it as an avoiding and shutdown mechanism. So I, um, which is leads to the next great question, uh, when do you decide to get therapy? Um, I actually didn't want to get 
therapy at all. I totally rebelled uh, rebelled against the the idea, as you could tell by my awkward body language, even talking about the idea of going to therapy. Um, I didn't want to go to therapy because I was the person that other people relied on. I didn't want to go to therapy because I thought it was too expensive. I didn't want to go to therapy because I didn't want to admit that I needed help. Um, I didn't want to go to therapy because I thought it meant that I was broken. Um, I had all sorts of phenomenally awful reasons why. Um, I didn't want to go to therapy, but they were totally rational to me to me at the time. Um, I actually lied uh, to my parents about going to therapy. My mom offered originally um, that I could go to, to therapy to, to support with dating. Um, and I said, sure, mom, I think I'm ready to finally uh, take you up on that offer, even though I knew in my head it was, for, it was for depression because I didn't want to admit that, oh, this is something that's wrong with me or that um, I'm broken. Um, until I finally hit rock bottom and actually hurt someone and realized, okay, like I really, I really need, um, need support and need help. Um, so I reached out, um, sort of without, uh, reaching, reaching out, um, started therapy, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy for anyone who's, uh, really curious about that. And it was sort of working. And then we got into this conversation about medication. Uh, which is a huge conversation for people. Uh, what are your thoughts on medication? And again, I emphasize this is purely my uh, my experience and my thoughts. And at first, I totally rebelled against the idea of going on medication. Um, I pride myself on my intelligence. I pride myself on my personality. And I thought if I go on medication, that's messing with my mind, that's messing with personality. I have no idea what the side effects could be. I made you can possibly make with medication, which is Googling the side effects in advance. Um, that is a black hole that does nothing for anybody. Because the second you go on the internet and start Googling side effects, well, this person gained 20 pounds, this person lost 20 pounds, this person had to increase libido, this person had decreased libido, this person helped in five days, this person made them even worse. You will find the craziest stories uh, online about, about medication. I do not recommend Googling uh, side effects. Have that conversation directly with your with your therapist. Um, eventually, um, I decided to, to go on medication because I finally got to a point where I was willing to try, um, I was honestly just willing to try anything because I got so frustrated with being in this, uh, in this hole. Um, the way I describe depression, it's um, you don't remember that there's a time before and you can't imagine that there's a time after and you sort of just get very comfortable in this black hole. Um, and it's your cave, and you make a home out of it because you might as well get get comfortable. And I finally got to the point where I wanted more, and I wasn't, um, I didn't want to be comfortable uh, there anymore. And I, um, yeah, so I went on uh, medication, went on Wellbutrin uh, for anyone who's who's particularly curious. Um, it's an upper, meaning it gives you it gives you energy. And I got really lucky that the first medication and the first dose, if you will, with a little bit of adjustments afterwards, uh, really worked for me. And I woke up the next morning and I'm like, wow, like I have energy again. I'm seeing the world in color. Like this is incredible. Like I imagine what it's like for people to have caffeine for the first time. They just feel so um, jazzed and alive and energetic. And um, part of me then also beat myself up and felt like an idiot for waiting this long. And if I had this one magical pill, then imagine what it could have been. Um, obviously that's also not true because it's medication and concert with the therapy and concert with me being open um, to the experience. So yes, it's that combination of the biological and, and psychological. And for me, um, it really worked. Uh, that being said, my complicated relationship with medication continued because as an independent individual, I didn't want to rely on the medication and how is this changing me? And even though I've heard a million times about people with diabetes and how they take insulin every day and why is this any different, um, I definitely had my pride factor still of why do I need to rely on this? I want to do this on my own. And I also felt as if, oh no, but I want to get out off this. The goal is to get off this. Um, neither of which I believe are healthy mindsets, even though those were my mindsets at the time. And if you're on medication, it's working for you. Great. Stay on medication. And if you're on medication, it's not working for you. Great. Talk to your therapist and talk to your psychiatrist and get on a regimen that, that works for you. Um, eventually for myself, um, I was weaned off of medication. Um, currently I'm not on medication, even though I was on for, uh, probably a year and, and change and through therapy and through medication um, I was really able to 
sort of shift uh, the way that I interacted with the world and the way that I saw myself and change my, my story and, and narrative. Um, and somebody asked me, um, so what are the tools that worked for, for me when it came to therapy, when it came to emerging from depression? Uh, one thing for sure was medication um, and addressing the biological component of what was going on. Um, meditation um, was something that's been really huge for me. Uh, I listened to uh, John Kabat-Zinn and body, do his body scan meditations on, on YouTube and mindfulness. Uh, because for me, uh, one of the ways I used to get myself into trouble was my thoughts would just start going in every single direction about uh, what we would call catastrophizing. What's the worst case scenario that could possibly happen? And I would find all of them. And then I would try to control all of them and come up with all the ways that I could respond to all the scenarios. Um, and what meditation does for me is uh, it brings me present to what I'm experiencing in the moment. Rather than, oh, here's everything that could possibly happen. It's, okay, so what's happening in front of me? And then trusting and believing in myself that I can handle whatever comes up. And building that tool of, okay, how can I be present in the moment? And the self-trust that whatever comes up, I can handle. Um, I would say are two skills that I learned in therapy that are really helpful for me. And a third that uh, any of my students have probably heard me say uh, a million times is the idea of reframing, that events in life are neutral, and I have the power to decide how do I want to interpret them, uh, whether they're events in my past or events going on now or things that could come up in the, in the future. So the idea that, okay, this happened, um, now what? And rather than beating myself up over, oh, here's what I could have done, here's what I should have done, and judging myself, and instead focusing on, okay, so what comes, what comes next? And I am by no means an expert at this. I beat myself up as much, if not more, than the, the next person, and I still have a very, um, we're working on um, a more positive outlook <laughs> toward, toward the world and myself and contributions and giving myself credit and focusing on the positive and not just focusing on the negative. And those are all things I get to work on and continue to build into a habit. And even recognizing, okay, this is a habit I want to build. And um, building those mental models and the habits of, um, I trust myself, I can figure this out. Um, or, okay, where's the positive in this? Or how can I reframe this? Or what do I do now? And how do I react to it because the past already happened? Um, so even just checking in with myself and becoming present to that um, was something that was really useful for me. And a final thing that was um, really useful for me uh, was we actually practiced this in therapy uh, using I feel statements that I um, wouldn't allow myself to feel emotions. It was one of my ways of controlling, so I'd even control my own emotions. And I actually practiced in therapy saying I feel and then I would label the, the emotion. Um, I feel sad right now. I feel happy right now. I feel angry. I feel frustrated. Um, and acknowledging the emotions, that way I could uh, deal with it, um, that I could manage it, that I could channel it into something. And developing that self-awareness uh, was something that was, that was really helpful uh, to me. And... Um, as opposed to fake questions that I just came up with for myself, this was an actual question. Uh, why does something need to be done about what I feel? I mean, that's totally up to you um, and whether or not you are where you want to be right now in life. <laughs> and if it's working for you, keep doing it. If it's not working for you, change it. Um, nobody's telling you how you should feel or shouldn't feel. It's, well, is it working? And if it's working, great. And if not, not. And uh, something that I know I like to emphasize a lot is the idea that we go to a doctor for physical checkups all the time. We go to a dentist for checkups, or at least we should. Uh, if my mother's watching this, she's probably laughing at me about saying that I go to the dentist. Uh, but we're supposed to go to the dentist all like every year for a checkup. But when it comes to our ourselves and our mental health and emotional health, uh, how often are we checking in with ourselves? So the idea of, yeah, so let me just go for a checkup. Where, where am I? How am I relating to myself? How am I relating to other people? What's the, the tune-up? Um, that's something that I really think that we should all do, just to be on track with where we want to be. And that's why these conversations with the Fort and Nefesh, I believe, are important because they really focus on mental health. That this isn't just about mental illness and what you do when you're sick, but really, how do I cultivate a healthy sense of self? How do I cultivate healthy habits? And I honestly think if we did that, 
um, we would avoid a lot of uh, mental illness because we'd be taking care of ourselves. And rather than doing what I did, which was wait until I hit rock bottom and break, <laughs> and then try to put the pieces together again, what if we took care of ourselves? And what if we had those had those checkups and and check-ins? So I just spoke about asking for support and asking for help. Um, here are questions that I know I get all the time. How or who do I confide in if, uh, how do I get help? Um, what if I'm alone or crazy for needing help? Um, you're not alone or crazy for needing help. Um, this was something that I went through a lot, was the idea that asking for help is coming from a place of strength rather than a place of weakness. Because when you ask for help, you're saying, I'm worth something, I deserve something. I know I, I deserve more than where I am right now. And when you're asking for help, you're really experiencing a sense of power that I am in control of this situation and I'm gonna reach out because I deserve support and making sure whatever comes next, comes next. And that's, that's something that is really powerful to say. And that feeling of, okay, what if I'm alone? Um, so create connection. And one great way of doing that is asking to have a conversation hey, um, I know we haven't spoken in a while, or hey, I know we haven't spoken in this way before, but um, this is something that, there's something going on with me right now, and I'm wondering, uh, would you be open um, to having a conversation with me uh, about it? And that's, um, and that's, what, that's what I would do. Um, how can I get help? Talk to people. Um, if you're a part of an institution, um, go to the, go to the counselor, go to the school guidance counselor, parent, rabbi, advisor, teacher. Um, a lot of times I know I did built up in my own head. Oh, people don't want to help. They're not interested in helping. Um, they're going to brush me off. Um, but I really, I think you could be surprised by, by how people, uh, respond. And, and this gets to the next question. How or who do I confide in if people who are closest to me are the least understanding? I think mean, that's really hard. Um, and I would ask, okay, sometimes it's actually easier um, to reach out to somebody who, who you don't know. Um, I know for myself, one of the people I had the hardest time talking to about this was my parents uh, because um, they are the ones who are closest to me. So they're the ones who are most invested uh, in me. And the first time I told them, there was a lot of guilt involved. Uh, um, is it in some way their fault? Could they have done something different? And um, it wasn't simply a, oh, make this about Mark conversation. There's a whole broader uh, conversation going on and relationships there. They got complicated for me, uh, at least at first, uh, as a result. And um, sometimes it can be easier to reach out to people that you, you aren't as, as close with. Um, I'd recommend if you have someone you're close with, great, reach out to them. And if not, um, well, who are the resources um, in your community? Um, you have, um, again, whether you're in a school, teachers, rabbis, guidance counselors, uh, friends who might be able to reach out on, on your behalf. Um, there's uh, organizations um, like Relief um, that are anonymous for, uh, for Jews who want to be connected to a, to a therapist, so you can call Relief. Um, there's suicide hotlines and crisis text hotlines. And... Um, those are those could be resources for you in those particular times, and um, if you know me or not, feel free to reach out to me, and maybe I can support you in, uh, in connecting with someone uh, if that's something that 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 works for you. Um, to flip things, uh, a question that I've gotten from a few people is from the caregiver perspective: is okay, so I'm the friend of someone. Um, who is uh, depressed or going through a really rough time? Um, how do I how do I support them? I mean, empathize. Um, I'm going to say some really simple things that we all know to be true that we just don't do often enough, which is listen to people and be with them and not try to fix. Um, and acknowledge them because a lot of times when you're struggling with something, um, I'll use I language when I'm struggling with something, I would think I'm invisible or that nobody's noticing or nobody's seeing me. And to have someone just check in and say, hey, um, looks like some things are going on. Like, can we, can we talk about it? And put that invitation out there. 
And even if they say no, continue to put that invitation out there so that they realize that they're not being forgotten about. And when they're ready, that they know you're the type of person who's really curious and the type of person that they can really trust. And for those that are asking me about, well, what happens if they say no? Um, first of all, that's not a reflection on you as a friend. Um, it's a reflection of where they are in the moment. And I would interpret no as I'm not ready right now. And if you take it as a no, that means you're not going, you're not going back. And when it's I'm not ready right now, okay, so in a week, like I'll check back in with you. Um, in a month, I'll check back in with you. I'll keep on inviting you things. So that way, because if you're in, and I'll, when I was in that space, I didn't think I was worth anything. So when people checked in with me, I would say, oh, if only they truly knew, then they would have, they wouldn't have said anything. They wouldn't have asked me. And I, I, so I didn't believe people when they were checking in. And it took me a while before I realized, oh, they actually want this to happen. They actually do care. And that can take, um, that can take time. That could take effort and energy and consistency. And a lot of patience and a lot of care and a lot of love and a lot of support um, until they're ready. Because you can't make that decision for them. They ultimately have to make the decision for themselves that they're ready to uh, ask for support or they're ready to have that conversation. What you can do as a friend or a caregiver uh, is make sure that um, they know that the door is always open uh, for them. And that means that's a constant, um, again, without badgering and being annoying and user judgment, uh, checking in and building and maintaining uh, that, that relationship. And in a case where you're not sure if you're the one who can best support them, perhaps asking for support, again, from other friends, from parents, colleagues, rabbis, teachers, counselors, um, so that way you can be there for them in the best way possible. This is something that doesn't get spoken about nearly often enough. As a friend, um, that could be really exhausting. And we don't talk about it because we feel bad saying that I'm trying to be a good friend and they're confiding in me and I'm there for them. But like, it's draining to be that support for somebody else. And it's really hard to be that constant emotional support. And I'm, I'm tired and I want to be there for my friend, but this is really hard for me. And I don't know what to, I don't know what to do anymore. Um, because I want to be there except I'm feeling burnt out and resentful of, of everything that, that's going on. Yeah, it can be really hard to be the friend, roommate, spouse, parent of somebody who's uh, depressed or struggling uh, with, with mental illness. And um, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not able to take care of anybody else. And if you're coming to support from a place of resentment, um, it's nobody's going to feel supported. If you're coming from a sense of obligation, uh, nobody's going to to feel to feel supported, and I think it, it's totally legitimate to set limits and boundaries, so that way you can provide support, and at the same time, um, take care of yourself. And I think what's important is if you're going to say no, now is not a good time for me. Offer an alternative suggestion. Hey, I'm not sure I can talk now. What about now? So that way they know that you're not rejecting them. You're saying yes to a little bit later, so that way you can really be present with them. And in that way, you can manage the time um, better. And also, frankly, you're giving the other person the support skills, recognizing that, oh no, like you can last without needing this right now. Um, this is something that you can do and you can handle. And that way you can maintain the relationship and maintain boundaries and limits and also take care of, of yourself in the process. Obviously, um, and I'm not speaking about this because I'm not an expert in this at all when it comes to suicide, get immediate help um, and ideation, check in and ask them um, if they have a plan and their um, trainings for this. And obviously, if someone reaches out to you from that state, um, ignore everything I just said about checking back in later <laughs> and setting appropriate limits and boundaries. Um, but if we're not talking about a case of uh, someone's coming from that mindset, then... Um, you can set boundaries and still demonstrate that you care even without picking up the phone every single time they call and feel as if you're being held hostage 
to to what's going on um, in that particular uh, friendship and and conversation. Whew, uh, that one's always a uh, always a great one. Um, so a question, and probably the hardest one that that I got on Facebook was, uh, what if you're a parent um, who wants to have this conversation with your child, uh, but they're not receptive, or you don't know how to have that conversation? <sighs> well, um, again, I'm sharing from from my own from my own perspective, um, and just from uh, suggestions I've gotten from from other people. Um, first of all, I'd re-emphasize the, um, the invitation uh, perspective that I shared earlier of they might not be ready now, but creating an environment in the home and relationship with you that uh, you know they're there once they're ready, um, I think is paramount. I think that um, making sure that there are other positive adult influences in your child's life um, is critical. Uh, so that way, um, if for whatever reason they're not comfortable reaching out, um, there might be somebody else in their orbit uh, who they would be comfortable speaking with, um, who can mediate uh, between between the two. And having that um, having that influence is is important. Um, and I also think, and again, I'm not a trained parenting expert by by any stretch uh, putting aside the 10 years I've spent working with other people's teenage children uh, which makes me an expert in something although I don't know what that um, relationships are built over time and it all depends on what's the foundation of relationship that you've set with your child until this point what do we talk about what don't we talk about um, in this in this family um, can you come to me with anything? Is you being perfect the most important thing in the world, or is it that we have an honest relationship with each other? And I think uh, so much of this conversation about what do I do now is really the product of a lot of decisions that came earlier. Um, that being said, okay, we're here now, now what? Um, I think that's the conversation about how do you demonstrate caring and love and support and non-judgmental listening? Because I know one of the things I was most scared of was being viewed as broken or being viewed as a failure or of uh, disappointed uh, my parents or letting them down because I didn't turn out the way that I was supposed to. And coming into this conversation from a place of I love you no matter what, um, especially over, over time, um, I think is something that's, that's crucial and, and critical. Um, to how to how to have that conversation with a uh, with a child or with a loved one that I'm asking from a place of love and asking from a place of support. Yeah. Okay. Um, remarkably, um, I think it's my last time talking about a lot of things outside of the title, which is living with mental illness. So, what's it like to live? <laughs> With with mental illness and a question I got from another friend was okay well, um, How do you deal with people making jokes about what's uh, what's going on about OCD about depression? Oh my god. I'm so depressed. Oh my god. I'm so OCD um, I think that language is critically important and that's something that uh, We totally get to work on and change and I know is possible and I'll use a couple of examples um, Of words I wouldn't normally say but like when it comes to the n-word um, as it relates to racism uh, when it relates to the R word, it relates to people who, who live with intellectual um, disabilities. Like those are words that people used to say all the time that we don't um, anymore. Um, ditto with how we refer to people with alternative or with different types of sexual orientation. Um, there are words that we used to use that we don't anymore uh, because we realized how uh, alienating that that language was and how it made people feel less than and broken. And um, I do think that when it comes to OCD, when it comes to depression, when it comes to all these comments, oh my God, I'm so ADD, um, those are things that uh, we get as a society to start working on. Because yeah, if my friend makes a joke like that, I'm not likely to share with them about what's going on or feel as if I can be honest with them about what's going on in, in my life. And there are times where, and I'm not saying everyone needs to do this, where I'll, I'll call people on it. Um, I'll let them know, hey, I, I think that's inappropriate for 
um, for the following reasons. And it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and I, I hope it's educational. Um, and I think that's something that when we start making these announcements in, in schools or camps or summer programs about here's the language that we use, the language that we don't use, that we emphasize. This is language that we, um, this isn't language that we use. And that's not okay to, to joke about because these are serious, serious things and people deserve to get the, the support that they need. And every time we joke about it, um, it's essentially saying it isn't okay to live this way. Um, so we get to create a society that, that is more um, accepting of that and doesn't use language that um, that's alienating or confrontational in, in that way. Uh, going over the question list, what are some of the... Um, so those are uh, all the questions that were, that were submitted um, in terms of what people wanted, uh, wanted to talk about. Um, Something I know I've been asked a lot about, and someone actually just messaged me was, Mark, you've been posting a lot about 13 Reasons Why. Um, why do you have such a vendetta against the show 13 Reasons Why? Well, <laughs> uh, um, there are so many reasons um, that I have challenges uh, with the show 13, 13 Reasons Why. And fundamentally, it's because it is an overdramatic uh, representation of uh, and romanticiz romanticization of um, of suicide. Um, that is why I have such a challenge with with the show. On a fundamental level, I agree. Yes, we need to have depictions of uh, mental health. Yes, we need to have conversations around suicide. Yes, there are people who are getting support as a result of the show, and all of that could have happened uh, without the graphic depiction of the suicide scene, which goes against all guidelines for how to represent um, suicide on, on television. Um, first of all, it was graphic and provided a playbook on how to, uh, how to do it. Um, it was romanticized. If you actually look at the cinematography, like I feel bizarre saying this, but it's beautifully done. Um, the actual shot and the coloring and the impact um, and it, it valorizes it in a, in a very unhealthy way. Um, and there's, there is such a thing as copycat and the message of the show, which again is very different than the book is that everything that she was looking for in life and didn't find, um, this sympathy, the friends, the people who are caring about her and everything else, um, she was able to get it through death. And that's an awful message to send. And if they were trying to send the message of, oh, bullying is bad, there were lots of other ways they could have sent that message. Um, if they want to send the message that, oh, if we care about people, look at what we can do if we're their friends, there's a lot of other ways to send that message. And that's even before you get to the fact that the counselor um, in the show is depicted as a um, who doesn't know how to deal with her or deal with anything that's going on in the school and that obviously doesn't set up a model for uh, students asking their counselors for help, which is what they're supposed to do because it's what they're trained to do. And when you're having a sh and, and these conversations and pe the teens are watching these shows and they're not talking to their parents about it. They're talking to their friends about it and getting advice about it. And I've spoken to students of mine who are, um, who told me they're triggered by the by the depiction and triggered by things that are going on in the show. Oh, do you talk to your parents about it? No, 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 no. That's a friend's conversation. Um, like, what are, you, what are you supposed to do with that? Um, and how do we create an environment where um, our students and our children are comfortable talking to us about what they're watching? They're watching along with them or really initiating that conversation with them because this is what they're confronting. Um, my apologies for my Jeremiah and soapbox, but I, I think the show is dangerous. Um, I honestly, I honestly, honestly do. Um, well, uh, this has been lovely. Um, it's, uh, I can tell you it's done wonders for my self-esteem to watch the view count go up and down 
uh, depending on what I'm saying and when. And I've been making up all sorts of stories about what people find interesting and when people are signing off, when in reality it probably has a lot more to do with their internet connection or what they're having for, for breakfast. I, I hope that um, the questions I answered or some of my own perspectives that I shared uh, support you in, in your own life and, and asking for support in uh, supporting, supporting your friends or at the very least getting an insight into uh, what it means to live with mental illness. I'll sign off with one analogy and uh, uh, one way as six words to save a life, which is how I end all of my presentations. Um, the analogy that I use for living with mental health is if, for instance, you um, get a knee injury playing basketball and all of a sudden uh, you get surgery on it, the next time you play basketball, you tweak your knee. The first thought that goes through your mind is, oh my God, I hope it's not whatever, however you hurt yourself the, the first time. And then you keep going, you realize, oh no, okay, I got this. And eventually you build back up to like trusting your body, even though that question is always in the back of your mind a little bit. And for me, that's what's like to live with, um, to live with depression, to live with mental illness, that, okay, I've dealt with it, like I got it under control. Yet, if something happens, if I'm exhausted, or if I feel really sad, like my default go-to is, oh my God, I hope it's not. And then I access the tools and support network and asking friends for support, which is something I'm much better at now than I used to be, or using the reframing or using the mindfulness techniques um, to get present to where I am and then keep, keep going. And that's one of the ways I shifted from depression is what defines me to I am someone who lives with depression. Okay, this is something I get to manage. It doesn't control me anymore. I get to manage it. And it will always be something to manage um, but it doesn't have to define me and how I can choose to use it. Um, so for instance, in webinars like these or talking to people and using it uh, to support other people, like now I can view it as some sort of bizarre gift that I can give the world, um, but that's really stretching the limits of my reframing abilities at the moment. Um, like it's not something that I wish that I had, but now that I've had it, okay, how do I, how do I use it? And um, for me, that's one of the ways that I live with it is that I don't deny it. I embrace it. This is a part of who I am. I don't hide from it. Um, some people might say I'm too open about it. Um, for a different webinar, I can share all sorts of funny dating stories um, or people who know me as the depression guy from Facebook because they saw one of my videos. Um, but that that's who, that's who I am. Um, and that's a part of who I am. And I want to live authentically and share all of myself with, with everybody. Um, so that's how I live with it. And I think the more we talk about it and the more that people are open about it, um, I, again, I guess dating and work and how that shows up in work and asking for support from HR um, and how honest can you be at work, I think is something that we're still getting to. Um, when people ask me about dating, my answer always is, if they're not ready to have that conversation with me, then they're not ready to go out with me. Um, this is this is who I am. They're going to find that out eventually. So I'd rather be upfront about who I am and what I'm about. And if they can be with me, great. And if not, it wasn't going to work anyway. So I don't feel as if I'm losing anything in, in that regard. Um, I do think there's still a major taboo at work about what it means to live with mental illness. Um, I think that's something that um, I've struggled with, depending on the work environment, of conversations with managers and supervisors and uh, what support can you ask for and communicating. Um, I have found honesty has worked for me. Um, I can understand how in other work environments you really have to figure that out based on who you're with and HR. Um, I think that's really on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. What I would say, um, I've had this conversation with a bunch of people at different workplaces is you always need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Because if you're not taking care of yourself and if your workplace isn't an environment that supports you in taking care of yourself, then that's not a healthy work environment and you probably shouldn't be there anyway. Because long term, it's gonna come out. And long term, you're gonna have a reaction or long term, something's gonna bubble over. So if you're not in a work environment that supports you and your mental health, or your work-life balance or taking care of yourself, it is an unhealthy work environment and you probably shouldn't be there and find a place that does support you because you are too important to sacrifice yourself for your job. 
you are too important to sacrifice yourself for your job. Um, and if you're going back to relationship thing, if you're in a relationship with someone who's living with a mental illness, ask them, hey, what could I do to best support you right now? And don't let that define them. Um, they are a whole person. And this is something I know I struggle with where people would treat me as if I was fragile because I was depressed. Oh, can I say this? Can I not say that? And that's one of the reasons why I make jokes is, yeah, like I'm a, I'm a person. And if I need something, I'm gonna let you know. And if you see I'm reacting in a certain way, okay, then dial back. But the worst thing you can do for me is treat me as a diagnosis and not as a person. Um, I probably should have led with that when I had more viewers. So uh, Shani, if we can make that one of the taglines of this when we put the webinar back up, uh, treat me as a person, not as a diagnosis, would, would be the advice I, I would give. Um, I'm a person. We all have our struggles. We all have our stories. We all have the things that we don't know about and that encompasses the totality of who we are. So treat me as that, not as a diagnosis. Uh, that just demeans me and belittles me and puts me in this box that, honestly, I'm much, I'm much bigger than. Note to self, use that next time. It's kind of good. I like it. Yeah, so finally, six words that could save a life. Number one, or uh, I guess one, two, three, is how are you? Um, legitimately checking in with people about how they are. If you notice something is up with somebody, hey, I noticed that you haven't been out much lately. I noticed that you skipped a couple of days of work. I noticed that you haven't said yes to any of the Shabbat invites you're eating at home by yourself. What's going on? Start the conversation, check in with people. But sometimes they're too scared to make the first move. And when you extend your hand, at the very least you're giving them the opportunity to say yes. And keep checking in, keep showing that you care, keep demonstrating your love and support, and eventually you'll, you'll break through. And the final three words are, I need help. I need help is coming from a place of strength. I need help is coming from a place of I'm worth it, I'm acknowledging my own I. Um, I need help is not anything to be ashamed of. It's something we can be proud of, that I am worth it. I deserve it. Um, wow, well, we got a couple of new viewers, so apparently they heard the buzz about my treat me as a person and not a diagnosis line and signed right up. I'm assuming everybody else on the line is laughing at that joke because again, I'm getting no feedback from anybody, which is making this a fascinating uh, public speaking and emotional connection experience. So again, six words that could save a life. How are you? And I need help. Um, thank you so much for, for listening, for calling in, for uh, sharing with all your friends. Please feel free to reach out to me, marc, period, f-e-i-n, at gmail.com. Um, if you want to continue any of these conversations, or if you have any uh, particular questions that, that you want to ask or are, are curious about, um, I honestly believe conversations like these save lives. Um, people are going to ask for help as a result. People are going to support their friends as a result. And the more people that you are with in this loving, caring, and supportive way, and the more people that you're honest with about yourself and what you're about, um, that's how culture changes. And really, kudos to Rufo to Nefesh for all the work that they're doing to change uh, the culture and the way that we talk about mental, mental health. Because the more that we talk about it, the more that people are able to say, oh, like, that's me. And that's probably been the most gratifying part for me about sharing my stories. The number of people who have said, oh, like, the overachiever, high-functioning depressive that everyone thought was perfectly fine, but in reality um, needed support and is now leading a much healthier life because they asked for help. Oh, that's me. Oh, you also had to struggle with asking for help? Cool, I get that. Oh, you also weren't sure about medication, this thing or the other thing, but now you're able to? Wow, I didn't realize I could do that. Oh, you're telling me that even when I don't see a future for myself, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and as opposed to everybody else who's telling me everything's going to be okay? By the way, don't ever say that. You can't promise that things are going to be okay, but you can't promise that you're going to be there with people no matter what. Um, oh, that they're, oh, you get it. And I think when we have these conversations and share these resources, the more that we demonstrate we get it, the more that people are willing to say, okay, I can do that. So please, everyone who's listened, everyone who will listen, talk to your friends, talk to people, get support, check up on yourself, take care of yourself, and change, change the culture, change the world one conversation at a time. Thanks so much. Um, 
and have a powerful day.